welcome you to, yes, the fifth and final week of our series called Walk the Talk. I know, I, I'm feeling the same thing, right? Uh, this month in July, we've been taking this walk, this journey through the book of 1 Peter. We've really been studying and learning and seeing what it looks like to walk the talk of the Christian life. And you remember what we did in the first week? Chapter 1 was the first thing we did. We kicked off our new Bible Geeks, right? Our Bible Geeks Club, thanks to my wife, Sandy. She's still asking me when the Royalty is coming, so maybe we'll get some T-shirts and stuff, guys, and we'll make this a thing, right? Um, but I said at that time you could join this club by simply reading through the book of 1 Peter for this month. And to do that, it's five short chapters. You can read it in just under 20 minutes. My prayer is that you've been reading it, not just on Sundays, as we sang here, Sunday comes every week, right? But doing it every day. And if you haven't been able to join us on Sundays, that you can go out to our website at newhope.rocks slash messages, click on the current series, and you can catch up that way. And I just encourage you to do that. So, as we've done every week, I'd ask you to grab your Bibles. If you don't have one with you, you can get one at the Hub or in Next Steps, our bookstore. Certainly grab your device uh, and your favorite Bible app and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 as I, and follow along as I read this to us. It says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. That's it. Again, if my math is right, it's five-fifths, right? Five-fifths. Whereas my grandmother used to say, it's the whole thing, right? So we've read the entire book of 1 Peter one time together this month. And my hope and my prayer is that you continue to read it. Not just on Sundays, not just when we're here on church, but you would continue to read it and dive into other books. As a matter of fact, our small group, we've been studying and reading through 1 Peter together as we've done here this month on Sundays. And we've decided that we're going to go into 2 Peter, so just right after, right? We're going to start studying that book together. And I would encourage you to do that, or pick another book. Another one of my favorite books is James, five short chapters. Pick that, read it yourself, get in a small group. We need to read God's Word daily, right? That's what we've been talking about all month. And so I would encourage us to do that. But this is the final day in our series. But you have one more day in July to become an official member of the Bible Geeks Club. Okay, so let's do that. Now, I'd like to recap one last time as we dive into this final chapter and this closing chapter of Peter's letter to us. And if you remember in week one, chapter one, we learned how we have this hope through faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that hope, we're called to live this holy, obedient life. And to be able to do that, remember we have to change our thinking, change our minds. And not only that, we have to change our habits. 
our actions, what we do. And then in week two, chapter two, we learned how we have to grow up spiritually, right? That we have to crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word. And we have to continue to grow and learn and to walk humbly with God every day. And it's as he's building us up, right? We're being built up into his holy possession, his special people, so that we can live up into the life that he's called us and truly be his witnesses to this broken and dying world that desperately needs Jesus. And then in week three, chapter three, my wife joined me here on stage and we shared our story and we talked about how living into our marriage and allowing God to heal that relationship and what we had to do was really an example for all relationships and how we all need to live into relationships and so that he can change us and that we live these lives that are so beautiful, so compelling that people look at and say, what do you have? Tell me your story. And then we're willing to live out loud for God. And then last week in chapter four, we really learned how to respond to life's struggles and life's, dif life's difficulties by beginning to be more like Jesus, to think like him. Remember, the battle's in our minds, it starts there, and we need to start thinking like Jesus. And we had to prepare like him, right? We had to learn to pray like Jesus, and do it often. He took it seriously, so should we. And to bind all that together, we had to learn to love like Jesus. We gotta start loving like him. And you remember, we have to do these things even when I don't feel like it. In this final chapter, Peter reminds us one last time how we're to live into this life that God has called us to. And that we have an enemy that wants to destroy us. But that in that, and regardless of the struggles, he says, stand firm, stay strong. You're in good hands. Let's pray. Lord, as I do every week, I invite your Holy Spirit here, because this is your house. Father, I ask that you would just open our minds and our hearts and prepare them for your word today. And what we hear and what we learn today wouldn't just be for today, it'd be for every day. That as your Holy Spirit, as you change our lives, Lord, that we're willing to live into this and live it out for you. And everything that we think, say, and do would bring honor and glory to your name. It's in that name I pray, amen. So I'd ask, when life is difficult, have you ever doubted your faith? Have you ever struggled with that? Questioned in your mind? Maybe even, do I have faith? How strong am I in it? Have you ever asked, okay, God, where are you? What's going on? What are you doing here? Are you doing anything? Have you ever doubted or had a hard time believing you're actually in good hands? I was reminded of that commercial <laughs> this week as I was preparing that one, I think it's Allstate, right? It says, you're in good hands with Allstate. And it struck me that we're willing to consider that we're in good hands with an insurance company, but how many times we doubt that we're in good hands with a gracious, wonderful God. Amen. So another, thank you. <laughs> another of my favorite verses comes in the uh, book of Mark in chapter 9. And it's a story there where this man has a son who's um, battling or has seizures, basically like epilepsy. And he brings his boy to Jesus' disciples to have them healed. And his disciples can't heal him. And so he turns to Jesus and says, well, basically like they can't, but if you can. And Jesus looks at him and says, and I wonder how he looked at him quite honestly. Obviously I wasn't there, I don't know. But he says, if I can. And then he says, anything is possible for one who believes. And then right there in verse 24, Mark 9, 24, it says this, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That man immediately exclaimed, Lord, sometimes I doubt, but help me when I do. See, it's okay when we doubt. God can handle it. It's okay when we struggle with that. The reason it's one of my favorite verses is I've prayed it many times. 
Lord, I believe. Help me when I don't. See, in chapter 5, Peter wants to encourage us that regardless of life's difficulties, regardless of what's going on, regardless of this enemy we have, he wants to give us some instruction and show us how to stand firm in our faith, to be steadfast, and to really trust God. And he reminds us over and over, you're in good hands. So let's jump right in. Verses 1 through 4, it says this. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. See, Peter starts with an appeal to the elders, to the leaders of the church. Remember in chapter 1, he established his relationship with all of the Christians he's writing this letter to. And here, he's appealing to the elders as a fellow elder, it says. In John 21, verses 15 through 17, it's the story where Peter's already denied Christ three times. And then Jesus comes to Peter and says, three times he asks him, do you love me? But he gives him some instruction. And three times he says, care for my flock, care for my sheep, care for my people. So Peter knows as a fellow elder, as a leader, what it's like. And he really tells the elders here, this is what you need to do. This is how you care for God's people. This is how you lead as a shepherd caring for his sheep. Now, at this time in history, being a shepherd was a very low, low, low position. About as low as you could get, really. And we see in Scripture different stories about shepherds and how they care for their sheep. And I was reminded of one shepherd who later became a king. And that was David. When he was a boy, a young boy, he watched over his father's flock. And as he did, if we see this story, he watched over them at night. He watched over them all the time. It even says he protected them, right? It says he killed the lion and the bear to protect the flock, to protect the sheep. He went out after them when, 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 when one went astray. He'd bring it back. See, as we look at how King David... <laughs> Shepherd boy David cared for his flock, those sheep. He was a servant to them. He served the flock. And see, Peter's telling the leaders here, he's telling the elders, be servant leaders to God's people. He says, do it willingly, not because you're compelled to. Don't lord it over them. Don't be bossy. Don't do it for personal gain. That's not what this is about. He says, do it for God. And as Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Here's Jesus, right? We saw in verse 4, it says, he is the chief shepherd. He is the shepherd of all, the shepherd of all shepherds. And yet he came to serve. That's right, amen. Amen. He set the example for us. And as we learned last week, the more we start to think like Jesus, right? The more we start to pray like Jesus, the more we start to love like him, have that same attitude, the same purpose as him, the more willing we become to submit to God's will and not our own. So those who lead should serve well and set the example for everyone in all that we're called to do for God. And Peter says, because what I'm about to tell you for everyone starts with the leaders. Get this right. Make sure you get it right. Set the example. In verses 5 through 6, it says this. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud 
but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. See, as Peter's wrapping up this whole letter in this final chapter, he reminds all of us, all of us, starting with the leaders, you have to be humble. He says, be humble. It starts with humility. In week one, I shared a verse with you in Micah 6, 8, where it said, remember, we need to walk humbly with God, and I've been talking about that each week, walk humbly with God. See, it starts with this, with that humility. And it says we're to clothe ourselves. It's like getting up every morning and dressing yourself in humility. And it says to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. You may be thinking, okay, bud, so what does humility, what does being humble, what does it look like? What does all of this mean? That's a great question. I knew you guys have a great question again today. You've had great questions this whole series. I don't know, I wasn't surprised. It's really keeping me on my game, and I appreciate that. But I would suggest we look at what God thinks. In verse 5, Peter here references actually Proverbs 3.34, and it says this, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God opposes pride, but favors humility. That right there tells us that pride is the opposite of humility, right? So I think what God says is probably a pretty good place to start. So it's the opposite. Pride is the opposite of humility. So we start there. Pride prevents humility. It's the first sin. Satan was cast out of heaven because he he wanted to not just be like God, he wanted to be God. And pride will take us out. Our pride will take us out. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. So how do we get rid of our pride? How do we become humble? I would suggest we have to start with our motives. Our motives when we're doing something. You know, when, when I'm doing something, what is the reason I'm doing it? Is it to serve myself? For my own purpose, for my own will, for my own gratification? Is it to serve others for their recognition? Which actually is self-serving anyway, right? Am I doing it to, for people to say, attaboy, great job, pat me on the back and puff up my pride? Is that why I do it? Or do we actually do it to please God? Is that why we do what we do? See, I think we need to check our motives first. Why do we do what we do? And being humble means we're aware, again, of all power, of all things come from God, not from us. Everything comes from him. There, we're willing to do good, to live this life without getting any credit. I was just reminded this morning of what that looks like in our prayer circle with the storms that came through, right? And how people reached out to other people. See, social media can be redeemed, right? Because we have people reaching out to other people saying, hey, I've got, I can help, whatever. And it wasn't about getting the credit, it was about helping others. And we're willing to rejoice in someone else's successes, right? We're willing to rejoice with them. Not be envious, not be jealous, right? Peter's already told us, get rid of that old stuff. That's your old life. I came across this quote uh, from C.S. Lewis, and actually it's uh, how he thinks or he describes humility, and he said it's not as thinking less of ourselves, but as thinking of our, ourselves less. And I, I remember sharing in week three when Sandy and I were talking about our story and our struggles and where we were, that the big struggle for me was my pride. This was a great message for me to prepare. God does that to me. I was caught in my pride. My pride of what I had accomplished. My pride of where we were financially and in our lives and 
my pride, my strength. That's where I was. That's where I was living. Everything I had done. And God had to humble me. He had to tell me it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about me and it's about others. So I had to learn what that meant. I had to see and live what that looked like. And I remember sharing with you guys that one of the big things for me was, and I do it to this day, over 20 years later, where God said, whether you think you're right or not, you're always the first to say you're sorry to your wife. I had to be humble. That's where God got me. Started there. Don't toot my own horn, right? Uh, Will Rogers says this. This quote was so good. He says, get someone else to toot your horn and the sound will carry twice as far. <laughs> Love that, right? It's just like, wow. And you know what? We have a someone else. We have the best possible someone else to do this for us. In verse 6, it says this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under who? God's mighty hand, that who? He may lift you up in due time. He says, humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And probably many times in our lives we've thought of God as uh, sitting up there waiting to tell us what we've done wrong. And really what it's talking about here, God's mighty hand is that same mighty hand that delivered the Israelites out of slavery after 400 years, that stopped Egypt from taking them back, that went before them, the mighty hand of God that went before them to prepare the way and to protect them, that went behind them to protect them from the Egyptians. That God delivered, the mighty hand of God delivered his people out of slavery. We humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he delivers us out of slavery. That's the kind of power. Remember, we rely on his power and his strength, not our own. And when we do that, it says, if we humble ourselves under his mighty hand, he will honor us. He will lift us up. Remember, it's his power, not ours. His will, not ours. We shouldn't want to or need to toot our own horn. We shouldn't want or need others to do it for us. It says he will do it. It's pretty cool. He'll do it in his time. But Peter warns us too. In verses 8 through 9 it says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. In these two verses, Peter tells us, he warns us, be alert. Be alert, be prepared. It says, of sober mind. We've read about that in this letter, right? To have our minds, be prepared. Get ready for action. Always be ready. He says, what? We have an enemy that wants to destroy us. So take this seriously. Take life seriously. We have an enemy, Satan, says he wants to devour us, right? Like a roaring lion prowling around. Do you ever watch those, uh, those, those shows, the animal shows? I know today it's National Ge Geographic. I'm really going to date myself. Back in the day, it was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, right? <laughs> and Marlon Perkins, right? Right? I was Saturday or Sunday evening. I don't remember, but I remember watching those as a kid. See, I'm not that old. I was a kid then. Um, but I remember watching those, and you, ever, you watch the lion, right? When they hunt, when they're out on the prowl, they're looking for food, what are they doing? They're trying to isolate, right? They're isolating their prey, trying to get them alone, separate them from the herd, and then they attack, and it says devours them. 
And that's what our enemy has done from the very beginning. Genesis 3.1 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See, Satan wants to isolate us. He wants to isolate you. He wants to isolate me. And he wants to sow the seeds of doubt in our minds, in our hearts. That's been his tactic from the beginning. We just saw that. That's his tactic now, and that'll be his tactic till Jesus comes back. He wants to get us alone at our weakest moments. He doesn't want to attack when we're strong, right? At our weakest moments, to isolate us. He wants to sow seeds of doubt about God's word. Just said this, did God really say? Is that what you're hearing from God? We see this in scripture when he was tempting Jesus, right? He took scripture and twisted it. But Jesus came back with the right stuff. We should be in God's word daily. But he sows those seeds of doubt and he twists the words. He sows seeds of doubt about our faith, right? Well, do you really believe that? Should you really believe that? Is that what it really says? He sows seeds of doubt about ourselves. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. Who do you think you are? Right? He sows the seeds of doubt about others. Especially about Christians. We seem to do that with each other, don't we? He says, they don't like you. Bud, what are you doing up on that stage? These people laugh at you. What are you doing? So sows those seeds of doubt. Can you really trust them? Can we trust each other? Should you trust them? Does this sound familiar to anybody else, or am I the only one that feels this tension, sees this too many times? I know for me, my weakest moments are when I'm tired, typically, haven't got enough rest, when I haven't been in God's Word regularly, my weakest moments, you know, I'm alone by myself in my own thoughts, my own mind, my own head, right? And that's when he attacks. And for me, I was reminded, even, even during this month in preparing for this, of my weakest moments. And um, I was reminded, Peter started this whole letter, right? He started with praise be to God the Father, right? We said, let's start with that. So one of my favorite things to do is, I love that song by Casting Crowns. Nobody, have you heard that one? Love that song. And I grab that on YouTube and watch that video, and I'll just play it over and over and over again and just start praising God. But I love that line in there where it says, when the devil says, who do you think you are? Right, because that's what he does. And the response is, I'm not going to sing it. You don't want me to sing it. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that saved my soul. That's what we got to do. Do they? Awesome. I'll have to listen to that version. I like all kinds of versions of praise music. And you know what? Fortunately, we have a God who cares for us, right? Verse 7 says this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. All those negative thoughts, all those doubts, all those questions in your mind like that, remember, those aren't from God. They're from our enemy. So we were just told. See, our job, it says, is to cast our fears, our anxieties, our struggles, our troubles, everything on God. He'll take care of them. Cast them in his direction as far as we can. Make that decision. Anyone in here like to fish? A few of us? Okay. All right. My youngest son, Camden, loves to fish. I don't know even how many fishing poles that boy has now. He's like, Dad, can you send them to me in Honolulu? I'm going to find some fishing spots. Sure. <laughs> but when he was home between 
his uh, trainings back last November, uh, him and I went down to the river. That's another good song, by the way. Um, but we went down to fish. It was a little chilly, but we got in the river. And you know, when you're fishing, right, it's not always about like casting as far as you can, but it's casting that perfect spot, right, where you think or believe the fish are going to be. Getting that line right out there in that perfect spot. Well, we don't have to think where God is. He says, cast everything to me. I'm the perfect spot. See, he'll take care of them. That's his promise to us. And then in verse 9, Peter reminds us we aren't alone, right? He says that others are going through this. Others are going through these same struggles, the same kinds of sufferings, the same kinds of challenges, same kinds of temptations. And it's not just so we can go, at least it's not me. But in a sense, it is. Peter's saying it's not you. You're not going through this alone. See, our enemy wants to think it's us to think it's just us, right? You're the only one. You're the only one going through this. Right? He wants to isolate us. That's how he's going to take us down. It says like a lion prowling around to devour. So don't do life in isolation. We can't and we shouldn't. That's what our enemy wants. We have to do life together. Scripture says, do not forsake the gathering. Come together. Come to church. Get in a small group. Do life one-on-one. Because the enemy wants to isolate you. And we need to resist him no matter what. James 4, 7 says this, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Don't let the enemy isolate you. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Submit to his will. Submit to his will. Stand firm in your faith, and it says the enemy has to flee. It says will, not maybe, it says will flee. Anybody else think this can be difficult? Can it be hard? Yeah, I can. All right? Struggles in life, the mistakes we've made, the things we've done wrong, sometimes the pride we still have. We let him isolate us. We let him win. We'll let the enemy win sometimes and we lose ground. Anybody else? You know that saying, it's two steps forward and one back? Heard that before? Sometimes I think it's one step forward and two back. It just knocks us back. Life doesn't just slow us down. And we start to think, if only, if only, if only. Those are doubting words, right? If only. You know, this message, I think, was for me as God was helping me prepare because so many of the stories are of my life. And I'll never forget when Sandy and I, again, when we were going through our struggle, it was tough. There were doubts. God was bringing us back out of it. And, you know, my pride in myself was like, well, if only I'd done this. If only we'd done that. If only, if only, if only. And I'll never forget. My wife's pretty wise, if you guys know that. I'll never forget her looking at me and say, quit tripping over that stuff. Now, that wasn't the exact word she used, but I PG'd it for us. <laughs> and you know what? She was right. And fortunately, again, we have a God who cares, and he makes us promises. Verses 10 through 11, it says this, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. 
See, the promise is that God will strengthen us, that he will help us stand firm, that he will make us steadfast through all of life's struggles, no matter what we're suffering at the world's hands, at the, at the enemy's hands, God will do this. And in the end, he will make all things right in his glory in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing promise. Because that's an amazing promise. Peter says, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Satan's purpose is to destroy us. It says to devour us, to take us out, to ruin us. That's been his purpose from the beginning. That's his purpose now. That will always be his purpose, is to take us out. He wants as many to go with him as possible. But God says, trust me. Don't give way to your pride. Be humble. Don't give way to your fears. Cast them on me. That's what he said. Don't abandon your faith. I will help you stand firm. God says, I will restore you. I will lift you up. I will establish you. I will strengthen you. I will honor you. And he tells us, I will complete my work. Be encouraged. We're in good hands. But just need to trust his grace, his amazing, ever-present grace, always available, right? Our problem has never been God's faithfulness. Our problem has always been our faithfulness. And the final encouragement that Peter leaves us with here, he, in the second half of verse uh, 14, it says, peace to all who are in Christ. Peace to all who are in Christ. See, this is a reminder for us of what Jesus told us in John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You're in good hands. We're in good hands. So my challenge for us today, really my question is this, who would live this kind of life? Who would live this kind of hope-filled, holy, obedient life that God calls us to? Who would live the kind of life that's gonna humble themselves under God's mighty hand? that's going to think, pray, and love like Jesus? Who's going to live the kind of life that other people say, tell me your story. What do you have? Who's going to live that kind of life that honors God, submits to his will, not their own? And that we would stand firm in our faith, trusting his promises no matter what. My answer? Only those crazy Jesus people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your promises. Lord, I thank you for all that you are in my life, in our lives. Lord, I, I thank you that we've been able to study through your word this month. But my prayer is it's, again, it's not just about learning more and hearing more, but it goes from our minds to our hearts to our lives, that we would live into this life you've called us to. And through all the struggles, all the challenges, all the difficulties, that we would trust in you, Lord. That we would stand firm in our faith in Jesus Christ. And through that, our lives would just be so reflective of you, so beautiful, that we're able to tell your story through us. Father, I ask as we go from here today, that we would just continue to be in your word, to walk humbly with you, 
to live this life that you've called us to. And all the honor and glory will be to you. In Jesus' name, amen.